Timmy Joe reviews anything. Reviewing computer parts on YouTube. That's Woo! Right. You gotta be pumped on that, right? Well, computer parts! Woo! Oh, yeah. What's going on, guys? My name's Timmy Joe, making videos about computers all over the internet. And today on the program, first gen i7. Well, like, first gen 2.0? something like that. It's uh, the P55, which was the original chipset for the i5s and stuff like that, but the original i7 was the 900 series and it was on the X58 platform, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. This here though is a Linfield uh, processor and it is the i7-860. So I've reviewed the first gen i7 before, but never with this kind of setup on a P55 with the smaller chips that we're used to. This is actually an i3, um, what, uh, 550, which I might put on here and see what the first gen Core i3 can do uh, after this. But this is an 860, and I want to thank Brent, who sent me this motherboard and the processor, and didn't really tell me that it was broken, if I remember, but this was from some oil-cooled PC, and it's a really good EVGA motherboard. I'm really sad I couldn't get it rolling, but uh, the i7-860 that was in it works. Uh, I confirmed that with this i3 that this motherboard wasn't the problem. So another viewer, uh, Yuri, sent me this P55 gigabyte motherboard, which is the uh, P55GA P55-UD4P, which is, of course, a very blue, ultra-durable motherboard, uh, but it does the, the, the freaking job, man, because I have this... Whoops. Stop dropping that. Uh, I have this i7 first gen 860 at 4.2 gigahertz. Isn't that crazy? 4.2 gigahertz. They weren't meant to do that. And uh, it'll overclock like a dream. So I got a really lucky one because uh, I heard a lot of people were having trouble hitting uh, 200 BCLK overclock because these are locked multipliers. You can bring them up a little bit, but they're like locked at 21 or 22 or something like that. So you are BCLK overclocking and you can't actually, uh, here, look at the uh, the BIOS here. You can't change the uncore uh, like you can on the X58 platform. So a lot of the settings, you, uh, you know, will BCLK overclock end up going pretty high and make it hard to overclock past a certain point. But this one here didn't just go to four, which was as far as I got with the original uh, i7-960 on the X58 platform. I got this to 4.2 gigahertz, 4.2 gigahertz. And we're doing it with the Noctua NH, uh, was a, or NHU12A, which is their new tower cooler with seven heat pipes built into this little form factor, uh, you know, kind of like their 12 series always was, but it has two more heat pipes and they're really good new fans. They're like super kick-ass with like barely any room uh, around the, the, we'll have to do a review on this cooler, but it's able to overclock this to its max. So I didn't even have to get out like some crazy water cooler or anything. I don't think it's gonna go any further if I'm completely honest and the temperatures are in check. So I did try uh, some two, over 2000 megahertz uh, DDR3, but I wound up going with just a 16 gig kit just to make sure there wasn't any RAM bottlenecks uh, of uh, Dominator 1600 megahertz memory because I couldn't get it to go uh, any higher than 1600 megahertz anyways. Uh, so yeah, we got a nice little system here, RTX 2070, which should be more than enough to max this platform out. And we're gonna do a little bit of game benchmarks and what have you after we check out some of the, the stuff and things. So we have, of course, the Linfield, uh, you know, formerly known as Linfield, uh, like then Sandy Bridge and then Ivy Bridge, you know. There, so this is the OG Core i7 and it launched uh, just a little bit uh, after the 900 series that's on the X58 platforms, about eight or 10 months later. And it's on the 45 nanometer process. The recommended customer launch price was about $300, $305. It's a quad core with hyper threading. So it's an i7, you know, as we know it, uh, you know, except for, you know, Coffee Lake and beyond, but it's what the Core i7, what you imagine a Core i7 should be. So there's, you know, all the features there. And uh, yeah, this base clock at 2.8 gigahertz going up to a max of 3.46 on the turbo. 
but I'm again able to run this at 4.2 gigahertz, so pretty stellar stuff. Not doing too bad at all. So Q3 of, uh, of uh, 2009 was when this was launched, but we can see here uh, if we go back the um, X, or sorry, the X58 version, the i7 920 up to the 975 Extreme Edition, they were all launched in uh, 2008, 2009. So this this came a little bit after that, and uh, I guess yeah, the uh, 860 launched, and then the 870, and then uh, in May of the following year they did an 875K and an 880. Uh, very interesting stuff. So what's my opinion on this thing? Well, I certainly wouldn't want to run this as my high-end gaming rig because it will severely bottleneck even a 2070 as we will find out. But it's actually not as bad as I thought. I was telling anyone and everyone to stay away from the first gen uh, core series processors because they're not very good. But this one here, because of the hyper threading, it ain't too, too bad, especially if you're going to overclock. In fact, if you're getting an office PC where this runs at stock speeds, I'd stay away from that. You need that little bit of overclocking and some you know, higher memory clocks to make this any sort of viable here in 2019. But you see, Anantech actually said that uh, the core uh, i7, it's faster than the 920, and uh, their sources are saying that Linfield wasn't selling as expected. So this, you know, the whole deal, the i5s and the i7s, back when they launched, AMD had a quad core for 100 bucks in the Phenom series. So this was uh, actually, you know, not a very good value from Intel, if you would, uh, well, you know, if you believe it. But uh, I th eventually, you know, with the launch of Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge, they secured their lock on the very high being worth it. Uh, and, you know, ran that with that for years. We ran with that for a long time. So $300 processor, you know, uh, AMD side, that was getting you the best of the best. And $300 processor on here was only getting you the lowest end of Core i7. So yeah, interesting stuff. So uh, let's talk Cinebench then. Of course, we want to see what the Cinebench result is on this very highly clocked 4.2 gigahertz i7-860. All right, so we've got it up here, and uh, we'll check out some temperatures here real quick. We see here that we're idling at about 34 degrees with this cooler, so it's not doing too, too bad. And uh, here, we'll go ahead and run. I uh, made sure that everything's closed. We'll run Cinebench here, R15. I don't think we need to get into R20 for this specific one, but uh, we see we actually probably could delid this and get some perform or some performance out of this because one of these cores just jots up to like 90 degrees. Uh, and yes, these are have Tim on them. And I was going to, I was all ready to delit it, but it works so well, why would I break the processor and open it up if I it really don't have to? We see here that one core is getting up to 87 degrees kind of, uh, but levels off, but most of the cores are 80 and under. With this cooler at 4.2 gigahertz at I think 1.45 volts it's running up there. That's pretty crazy. There's a little bit of load line calibration happening to keep this thing running at this speed, but yeah, no throttling or anything, 4.2 gigahertz, and we see here that it does uh, see state down to 1800 megahertz, so a lot of modern features in this uh, the CPU, you know, run them pretty decently, and uh, I'm actually impressed with it. I wasn't thinking I was going to get anywhere near this level of Cinebench score, as we will see right now. 652. That is not bad. And I'm standing right beside that cooler, and it never it was barely audible. So I'm pretty impressed with that cooler so far. We'll definitely be doing a review on that. Thank you, Noctua, for sending me that over. But uh, if we look in our results down here, I actually got a little bit further than that. Uh, I ran it at 4.24 gigahertz. I had the BCLK just a little bit higher, and it, it crashed in one of the games, and I thought maybe the overclock was a little bit too high, so I switched it back. But I got a 663 max score with all you know everything close down and everything and if you look a couple of rows down here we see the core i7 3770 gets a score of 662 uh, at stock so this overclocked is actually reaching the stock speeds of two generations from here. So it's not quite as bad as, you know, uh, I thought it was. So how does it compare to um, the Core i7-960 that I reviewed before, which is, it's basically its brother, but on the x58 platform. If we go over here, well, I have my old video up here, and sorry, it's the 950 I reviewed, and uh, we'll go ahead and just run the Cinebench. We got a 611, and I was only able to hit four 
gigahertz with this processor and uh, it's the same uh, manufacturing process too. They're both 45 nanometer, but you actually look at my test bench there. I'm running a 1080 Ti and uh, a really big uh, 280 mil rad with the uh, Gamer Storm uh, AIO. So I'm able to get better performance on this 800 series i7 than I was with the X58 version uh, with, uh, you know, I know I won the silicon lottery here, but with a much better cooler. So that's why I'm so impressed with this. It's, it's pretty decent. And then you want to see what like, um, the next generation could do, uh, what was possible if you overclocked, uh, uh, i7 2600K. Well, of course I went on, oops, the old, uh, YouTube and I found, uh, yeah, here we go. 852 overclocked to, uh, what, four, four, four or five gigahertz. So this one pretty much drops the bucket at 4.2 gigahertz, but a 2600, which isn't even the best i7, 2600K, I should say. There was a 2700K too. And then of course, even better than that, there was the uh, Ivy Bridge 3770K. Well, it's able to run at five gigahertz and it gets about 200 points better in Cinebench. So yes, <laughs> Sandy Bridge is much better. You know, it's, it's, it's got basically a 25% increase in its IPC over the previous gen, well, sort of, because this is running at a higher frequency, but its ability to get there. So yes, this is not doing as bad as I thought it would do, but it's nowhere near what an actual, you know, overclocked uh, Sandy Bridge chip can do, unfortunately, unfortunately. So we'll talk uh, gaming now. Uh, I've got the uh, GT, or sorry, RTX 2070 on here. Way overkill. That would not be a process or a GPU you'd want to pair with this processor at all. But uh, it gets a 7,045 in Time Spy with that graphics card overclocked. Uh, as far as the, the GPU will go as well, over 2,000 megahertz ish, and uh, yeah, uh, it's got a CPU score of 2,897. And then if we look at the uh, score, well, we've got it on my uh, new test bench, the 7820X 8 core Intel. We see here it gets, uh, well, it, it does have double the cores and. It's only at 4.8 gigahertz, but it's a significant jump in IPC by that point. But it's getting like 1,800 better uh, total in Time Spy, or sorry, uh, 2,800 better, I should say. 2,800 better, yes. And the CPU score being 2,897 versus 10,589. So, yeah, there's definitely some performance on the table to go with a newer platform than this. Max graphics card, I would think, with this, you'd ever want to run would be like a 1060, three gigabyte, maybe the 1660, may, maybe, not not even, RX 580, RX 570, it, all below that, you could probably game with this and kind of, you know, max your graphics card out a little bit. But with the 2070, as we're gonna see in these benchmarks, it certainly <laughs> leaves a lot to be desired on the table.
Yes, we see here there that in a lot of those games, the performance was halved using this i7-860 over, you know, a, an eight, well, double the cores in 7820X, uh, way more modern, you know, 10 years later platform. But, well, no, it's like eight years, but still, he was able to keep the frames over 60 frames a second with a 1080p maxed out on, in every one of those games for the most part. So it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. There was definitely some frame time issues in some of those games. I would say that although this processor has all the instructions and stuff like that to play every game, you know, there, there's no issues there. There's definitely some optimization that's been had on newer processors that's lacking on this for sure. But in the end, uh, you just have to severely limit the expectations of what graphics card you could pair with this if somehow you were going to pick this up for a budget gaming rig. Uh, as we, you know, we saw, it was able to push FPS with a decent graphics card over 60 frames a second at 1080p. But a real life scenario is gonna be, you're gonna pair this with like a GTX 970 max, I would say. And uh, you know, you'd be lucky if you can max games out at 1080p uh, from 2019. But uh, for games before, you know, 2018 and before, there's a pretty good chance you can run 1080p max settings with the right graphics card with this platform. Uh, this, in the end, is just kind of like a little blip on Intel's history of i7, uh, you know, just to just kind of show where it came from. It's certainly better than the Core 2 quads that came before it. And of course, with hyper-threading, it's able to, you know, to do like the, the best you could ever do on a Core 2 quad without hyper-threading is about 500 in Cinebench. This is able to get 650 in Cinebench, and it's, you know, I'm using an air cooler, so it's not too, too bad, but uh, it definitely when you talk about Sandy Bridge and Ivory Bridge coming after it, that's that's where you want to be at, because it's still relevant today. So, I'm not watching me do on Instagram and Twitter. Hit that like button if you want to see me run the i3-550 uh, in this motherboard and see how far it'll overclock, and then run the same kind of tests and see just how bad a dual core can do in 2019 but i'm not watching Jimmy joe instagram and twitter and i want to thank uh brent and yuri for sending me this hardware which allowed me to review uh you know what's going on this motherboard is actually pretty sweet even though it's it's uh blue a couple of cool things about it is it still has ide connections and a pci slot not pcie but like pci slot so it's a pretty modern platform that still has a lot of backwards compatibility. You could still run an IDE hard drive on it. You could still run some old sound cards and stuff like peripherals and stuff like that with it. So, you know, there's a reason to keep this around, but gaming might not be one of them. But, you know, there are people out there that, you know, run across a deal on this. If there, I kind of proved that with the right graphics card, you can game with this as long as you're not going over 1080p in 2019. So I'm not watching you join Instagram and Twitter. Thank you very much for the guys sending me this. If you have any cool, you know, stuff you want to send me, uh, me at timmyjoe.com. I'm looking, you know, I, I don't ask for your, you know, whatever, but if you have some rare stuff, it's always fun to see it on the channel here and watch me overclock the crap out of it. I want to thank Nachua for sending me the NHA12U, uh, and uh, you'll definitely be seeing that in, or U12A, I should say. You'll be seeing that in its own review separately, but uh, yeah little Linfield, not as bad as I thought, but certainly not good enough to mess with any processors from this, you know, this time frame. Uh, but hell, it's a good little budget option if you can get it real cheap. I'll see you guys in another video. Thank you very much for watching. I'll watch you on Instagram and Twitter. See you later, I3s.